Hello? Hello, Seattle. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Hello, world. Well, hello. Wholly independent and completely untethered since 2009, this is the Marty Reamer Show podcast. Reamer. Reamer. From their west side basement. West side. Lodged between the mold and the bad memories. Marty's story is like many of the others. It started with marijuana cigarettes. Here are your hosts, Jody Brothers and Marty Reamer. Marty Reamer. And here we are for another podcast. After a smoking hot weekend, Mm -hmm. both literally and figuratively, we had a great time this weekend. We're back here in the basement on a gorgeous sunny morning in the city of Seattle. It is Monday, the 26th day of July that we are laying this down. We, uh, We had the... The great honor of being the Grand Marshals of the West Seattle Parade on Saturday, yeah. Jody and I. Yes, yeah, so suck it. Which is, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of being in a parade or Grand Marshaling a parade, but it is a heady affair. You should do it. When you start out and the streets are lined with people and they're all applauding and they don't really know why they're applauding. Who I think is it's that? just like, oh, finally, this thing's getting underway. <laughs> Who is that? But you, when you're in the parade, you think, this is all for yeah. us. And you're waving and people are waving back. It's yeah. awesome. But, as with many things in my life, <laughs> that ego boost only la- lasted for about 35 seconds uh-huh. until I heard the first person say, Marty Reimer, who is that? <laughs> or how about that one guy who's like, yay, the mountain. Yeah. Love radio. <laughs> and then, I love your morning show. And then Jody said, radio's dead. And he goes, screw you. <laughs> I think that's how that inter- And they were waving. <laughs> waving. The yeah, uh, that was weird. phrase not heard before at a West Seattle parade. Oh my God, there are Jody's big boobies. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, a phrase never heard before. There's Jody and her big boobs. And no joke, that dress. So, uh, no, we really had. It was fun. And thanks to Jim Edwards for uh, for lining us up to be grand marshals at the parade because a good 40% of the crowd was like, who is this? And yeah. why are they grand marshals? And, uh, well, and the also, the kids were mad because we didn't have any candy to throw out because it's illegal to throw candy. But all the kids had their empty bags, and that's why they were waving because they wanted us to give them something. Yeah. Everyone wants In fact, blood. one of the emails I got here over the weekend was, uh, you guys look like you're having a great time. Will you be throwing candy? No. And uh, no, it's illegal. Seattle ordinance. Can't yeah. display cadavers. Can't throw candy. Garbage. And uh, But we want to thank uh, Steve and Annika. Yeah. Our, uh, wow. Our sh- I know. I they, cannot they believe you remembered their names. Must have been important to me to remember, but they were our chauffeurs. They were right. driving the convertible Volvo that right. we were sitting on the back of, and uh, it was me and Jody and my daughter, soon-to-be four-year-old daughter, right. uh, Josephine, and I told her, uh, I guess I did my work in prepping her for the parade. I said, you're going to actually be in the parade, so you're going to have to wave the entire time. Right. And as soon as they set us in the car and staged us to launch in the parade, which was, sadly, about an hour and a half before the parade launched, she started waving. Yeah. And from that point on, like, we weren't moving. There wasn't anyone around. She was waving. Yeah, there's some pictures of her looking bored, but she's daddy's girl. Yeah. What are you going to do? She's number one. Yeah. We have a a very special guest here in the studio today, and uh, maybe it's too early to judge, but he's been here for a a half an hour already, and I really like him. I like him, too. (laughs) Let's uh, <laughs> let's act like he's not even here. Yeah, don't turn his mic on. Uh, you, but sadly, Dave, we usually say this even when we don't like someone. Right when they're standing here, I'm not sure I'm going to get along with this person. I think this is going to go poorly. He doesn't seem to have much to say. No, but I really do like him. Yeah. He sounds like a like he's good to the core. Yeah. Uh, Dave Bazan is here. Hello, Dave. Hey guys. How's hey. It going? Uh, Dave, Dave Bazan is a bumbershoot performer, and we fulfill another obligation. This is the only reason we're doing this, Dave. We are obligated. <laughs> We'd never have you on. I, I already knew that. <laughs> As the official podcast of Bumbershoot, we have uh, Dave Bazan on. Uh, Dave uh, used to be in a uh, band uh, a fair number of years ago now. When was the last mm-hmm. show you guys played? 2005. Five? Yeah. Wow, uh, has it been that long? Mm-hmm. Pedro the Lion. Yeah. Pedro the Lion. David Bazan is uh, playing with his, uh, with his new band at uh, Bumbershoot on Sunday at the rock star stage yes. now okay yeah Hello. grand marshal is a heady title but rock star yeah. uh-oh uh, better it, bring it i'm in therapy to try to <laughs> work that out that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh on sunday of the uh, labor day weekend it'll be dave bazan at the rock star stage which is on broad street yeah that should help you uh locate well dave thank you very much for coming in it's great to have you here my pleasure uh we've already had like a, a wonderful conversation it's always 
like I say uh, quite frequently, we, we, that we should air the half an hour leading up to the <laughs> podcast and then the actual podcast. Ah, who cares? Right. It's just us talking about our our parade and how great we and are. <laughs> oh, we did great, don't you think? Yeah, I think we did great. Uh, anyhow, uh, a couple other uh, emails that have come in here uh, in the past uh, twenty four hours or over the weekend. Um, another email about our our parade duties about a picture that was posted online of us in the parade. Uh, Elizabeth writes, "Did Jody's husband give you that shirt too?" Yes, he did. And it's true. That was a Jody husband shirt. Most of my wardrobe comes from Jody's husband because he's gotten, I don't know, too fat? Is that uh, too fat and too short. Too fat. <laughs> <laughs> he got shorter? <laughs> no, he one day he decided He doesn't question that, the weight issue at all. Yeah, right? no. He decided one day that all of his clothes were inappropriate because he has a length issue. Like if the back of the shirt goes down to mm-hmm. his butt, then it's too long and he looks dumb. So I just emptied out his his closet and just gave it all to Marty who yeah. had four shirts previously. Uh-huh. And it was a it was a huge win for it was me. It's like the best day of your life. It was. Yeah. Like I have uh, although I'd like to point out the shirt I'm wearing now not one of David's is shirts. not one of David's shirts. Was Look at the buttons. Terrible button placement. What? Yeah. They're on the front of the shirt. Where else should they be? Maybe you should have more of your chest hair poking out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe everyone should see a little bit more. Do you have a safety pin or something? <laughs> Hit the one in between. Well, I could button one higher, but whenever I do, my wife says, it, oh, this that is looks cause, stupid. Yeah, it's, it does look stupid. It's a Costanza shirt, and I never would have bought that one. Yeah, the button placement is bad. George Costanza? Yeah. He had an issue oh. with the buttons. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> I want to go on record and say I like that shirt better than she does. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. That's why I knew. I knew we were going to have a connection over my clothing. Dave, you can give me that cheese back whenever you get a chance. Uh, I only got half left. <laughs> we... <laughs> Here's another email. Uh, Terry writes, uh, just got caught up on two and a half weeks worth of podcasts. If that isn't like a, a strategy they should use at Guantanamo. <laughs> just, just listen to the Yo, <laughs> Habib will be uh, listening to two and a half weeks of the Marty Reamer Show podcast. Yeah, that is a lot. Especially uh, the last two weeks. That's a lot of sexual innuendo. I uh, just got caught up on two and a half weeks worth of podcasts. I feel like I have missed out on so many things. Shoot, never again. I vow to stay current. All right, Terry, that's something important. Yes. That's an important vow. Um, uh, before we uh, get too deeply into today's show, tomorrow we have Chris Mays joining us from, uh, she'll be live from Austin because mm-hmm. Robert Plant is playing with his new band, one of the few shows that he's doing here in the U.S. down in Austin tonight because that's the band with Patty Griffin. Yeah. Allison uh, has been kicked to the curb. Yeah. So it's Robert Plant and, and Patty Griffin and his band. And uh, Chris Mays will be there. She's the music director here for the podcast. And so uh, we'll be talking to her. Um, speaking of concerts... An ill-fated outing in uh, St. Louis. I don't know if you've heard about this, uh, Dave. This just happened. Kings of Leon, on Friday night, canceled a show in St. Louis. Reason? Reason. Uh, Pigeon poop. Only in St. Louis. Yeah. Kings of Leon were performing in St. Louis on Friday night, but after just three songs, they canceled the gig because pigeons were literally pooping on them from the rafters and into Jared's mouth which is disgusting yeah I know because at first you think come on how yeah. rock and roll are they that they can't play through yeah man up pros play hurt uh, but it was apparently really bad yeah. according to reports there was an unknown but apparently significant number of pigeons in the rafters of the Verizon Amphitheater the band spokesperson says quote I'm surprised they stayed on for as many songs as they did and by that he means three uh, bassist Jared was hit several times during the first two songs on the uh, third song when he was hit in the cheek and some of it landed near his mouth they couldn't deal any longer it's not only disgusting it's a toxic health hazard they really tried to hang in there we want to apologize to our fans in St. Louis and we'll come back as soon as we can uh, Jared who for what it's worth admits he's a germaphobe yeah. says quote I was hit by pigeons on each of the first three songs we had 20 songs on the set list by the end of the show I would have been covered from head to toe you know this is the Verizon Amphitheater's fault because they knew they had a pigeon problem they told them beforehand yeah that's right can you just get one of those owls seriously they're an amphitheater what are you gonna do just yeah, let ven- pigeons the- shit all over everybody every single time someone plays the venue warned the band before the show that they had a quote significant pigeon infestation problem with summer shows over the years but they were doing all they could to fix it apparently they failed uh, this is actually a YouTube a YouTube video of uh, right after the crowd right after they made the announcement that the show was over we appreciate your understanding and your safety alone and please give yourself over the exits thank you once again please leave safely to the exits and then the crowd, so, like literally the camera's panning the crowd and the crowd is kind of like, what the hell? Is this true? And now they're starting to chant refund. Yeah. 
Which, in all fairness, they should get. Of course, they're yeah. going to. Yeah, yeah. They will. I I can't imagine that they that they wouldn't. They live in St. Louis. There is literally nothing else to do. These people are now miserable. Well, I mean, there are. Well, St. Louis is not bad. Yes, you could tour the Budweiser plant. Oh, that's good. For the 18th time. Right. Uh, so anyhow, that's what's going on. And I imagine, I mean, you you have had some ups and downs in your career, Dave, but uh, mm-hmm. nothing like that, uh, mm-hmm. I'm guessing. No, no pigeons pooping near my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Consider that a win, then. Yeah, that is. Uh, Dave Bazan is, uh, like I said, performing at Bumbershoot on Sunday, September 5th on the uh, Rockstar stage. Uh, his... Uh, solo release is called curse your branches but you also have a live cd called live electrical audio Mm -hmm. so those are your two latest releases that are out they are um i one thing we were talking a little bit about this before we signed on to the podcast that i love about your website is every band website has a bio page right Mm -hmm. it's required but most band websites focus on the highlights of the career and they touch on you know won three grammys in 1987 and you know voted up and coming, you know, bad to be watched by Rolling Stone magazine. What I love about your bio page is you touch on some highs, mm-hmm. but also some low the lows. Lows, Dave. And it's fascinating to read because it's like, wow, this is really out of the ordinary. Yeah, we we were just tired of the normal band. It's all this hyperbole, and it and it really lacks credibility. I mean, it, you read it and you think, really, I don't know which part of this to take seriously. And so, we just thought. Let's just write something that we would want to read about somebody. And it just so happened that I you know, had a couple of rough years. And so that made it pretty <laughs> uh, entertaining. It seems from it is entertaining. A, 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 a quick run through of the year by year tally, it mm-hmm. seems things went dark in around 1999. Yeah. <laughs> Up to uh, that yeah. time, it was like sold out shows mm-hmm. and, and big records and got married. Yeah. It, you know, it kept, it, it actually did keep going well until. Um, I think th- I didn't see the writing on the wall till maybe 2005, but it it appeared in 2003. 2003. Yeah, that was when. Um, May 2002. Mm-hmm. An excerpt from yeah from the the bio here. Bazan finds himself in the awkward position of having to justify the subject matter of his new songs to a handful of disenchanted and frustrated Christian fans in each city along the tour. Mm-hmm. So for those that don't know, Pedro the Lion was a Christian band. So in sort of it was vague. It was difficult to to tell, but. Some you were thought. raised an evangelical Christian. I was, certainly. In fact, you were. your father was involved in the church? Yeah, he was a music pastor at all the churches huh. growing up. Yeah. It, here in the, the Puget Sound area? Uh, by the time I was in high school, we were here, yeah. Okay. And then at some point along the lines, you start to question your faith. Mm-hmm. And now how would you classify yourself? Um, I mean, not that you have to, but I mean, uh, agnostic? Is that what? That, I mean, that's the closest, I think. You know, I, I'm more interested... Um, in those questions than I think I ought to be or most people are yeah. uh, but I don't know where I land on yeah. it, so, so uh, this comes up time and time again I'm guessing from fans that were uh, into your music yeah. early on they feel like you have uh, abandoned them in a way there, there is there is a f- sense of betrayal um, but I do try to point out to them that in most cases what drew them to m- my older work uh, apparently, at least, is the questioning nature of my songs, even when I was a professing Christian, and uh, now I'm just taking that a little further and beyond their comfort level. But in each in at, at each stage, there was always people who found the work frustrating and um, uh, offensive, and there was also people who found it refreshing. And so that's continued. It's just you piss off some people and excite others. Right. Don't don't they say to be successful? We've literally talked about that, that yeah. to be successful in any creative endeavor. If you aim for 100% approval, it's going to it's going to blow. Yeah, yeah. I think even Ricky Gervais was, I'm comparing myself to Ricky Gervais, <laughs> uh, was saying that he'd rather, you know, have a really strong connection with a few people uh-huh. than like a, you know, not very strong connection with millions of, of people. And it, that's tough, though. Yeah. It's, it's easier, obviously, to be loved by everyone. It, it sort of is, but I do feel like maybe there's more insecurity. It's tough to quantify that, like on a psychic level or or whatever, when it's just these masses. And, yeah. and you can have real uh, connections with people, even if it's, you know, fan to artist. Uh, but if it's a little bit more deeply rooted in something and it's not just, 
you guys are my favorite band to look cool and drink to. Uh-huh. Like that's not that satisfying. Anymore. You personally, what was the turning point for you? Was I, I mean, I, I like I said, at some point here, I start to see the the hard drinking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Usually, when you do start drinking and doing drugs, you see God. You you <laughs> stop seeing God at that point. Well, yeah, it was. Um, you know, growing up uh, evangelical Christian, there was pl- I was pretty obsessed with um, reform within that movement because when uh, you know when I would study the Bible or what have you, it did it didn't seem like that the practice of Christianity where I was was in line with that or was consistent with that. And so I spent, you know, my high school and early college age years um, really obsessed with that. And but because of that, it got me looking deeper and deeper all the time into the core uh, values of my faith and where those things came from and how valid they were or weren't. And pretty soon, just looking deeply enough into it, I just I don't know, I just ran out of rope there. Just it didn't it didn't add up. Um when I got down to the nitty gritty in my mid twenties, is your is your wife a Christian? I believe she is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Have you met her? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's not such an easy answer anymore. Uh, yeah, well, that's a good. I mean, as Jody knows, my background with my wife, my my wife was an eva. Or, and, and again, I don't know how I'd answer it for her now, but yeah. she was an evangelical Christian when we met, and everyone thought that's never going to go anywhere. Yeah, he's darkened her light, that's <laughs> for sure. Uh, <laughs> he's smudged it. <laughs> it. But there was something, you know. There, uh, I mean, n- not to make gross generalizations, but it, in my book, there are two types of of Christians. There are the ones that are just obsessed with the dogma, yeah, and then there are the ones who, and and my wife falls into this category, who are who nice really, people who do good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Who like kind of. Uh, like take the golden rule out of all the dogma and say, do unto others yeah. as you would have done unto you. Enough said. Right. Yeah. And, I like those Christians. And, I get along with them. Yeah, as a and Jew. as do I. And that's the type my wife is. Yeah. So there was one of those kind of Christians. I think his name was Jesus. Yeah, he yeah kind exactly. Of summed it up. I've heard of that guy. <laughs> How many times does that conversation come up? And you should have dinner at our house when uh, the topic of like, uh, g- gosh, that is Jesus. Yeah, and yeah. and it's usually the ones that they're throwing rocks at the mo- well. And yeah. they, I guess don't look at me. In the, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you rock thrower, you. Oh, I know it. Uh, anyhow, Dave Bazan is here. What about your kids? Uh, how do you then raise your, your kids? Um, well, do you go to church? Um, I, I don't. Uh, my wife uh, does uh, often, but since our son's been born, it just hasn't happened for whatever reason. She asked me, periodically she'll request that I join her, and um, even though I really don't want to do that, I will oblige because I really like her ah. <laughs> and God, it uh, sounds so much like our household like my wife I think for her last birthday her wish to me was that I would go to church with oh, her it's once, so sad God her life month. is so sad <laughs> I feel so and, bad for and her. my my response was well maybe but I think actually it would do you a disservice like, well that's what we found uh, is I went with her every week for about six weeks and she just finally said you know I don't think this is really working out <laughs> because God Marty I would never want you to go to church with me he'd be sitting there making comments about oh you're yeah, right i would oh, yeah, i would i was keeping i was like writing stuff in a notebook That's and then exactly. i wanted to talk i would be like so what did you think about when he said this and she was like i don't want to talk about it yeah oh my god i swear to god you're talking my life <laughs> oh my here god. i don't write it down yeah but the last time i went to church the sermon was on it's a famous biblical story and i'm going to do it uh, do it injustice here but it's the story of the guy who takes his son out to uh, to kill him because yeah, God Abraham told Abraham and Isaiah. A- a- Abraham and Isaiah. Yeah, and they the the whole sermon was devoted to that. Mm. And I'm going, if this doesn't inspire lunatics to do horrible things, yeah. and he's saying it at that level too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this church is terrible. This is the worst birthday present ever. I I mean, they <laughs> spun it in a way that was that you know inspirational. Yeah. But I was like, all it takes is one you know one synapse not firing quite right, and you like go, no God told me to kill my offspring right. yeah and then and in the in the for those that don't know the bible as well as i do <laughs> let me fill you i'm in sorry on that. that you're listening to this podcast <laughs> <laughs> go on the uh, you know, at the last second god says psych yeah to abraham and yeah. says didn't, Os- didn't, ostensibly didn't, yeah <laughs> and i'm like really those are the kind of games god's playing with people i was like wow wait abraham wasn't supposed to kill his son and he did god said psych and the kid was already dead no no he, no, he right before oh yeah, he, he did catch him before it was fortunately a, a call didn't come in at the last second like yeah. oops <laughs> and it was a test yeah to see uh if abraham had true faith like because yeah, i was gonna say the bible is sad 
It's a little sad. Yeah, there are some, <laughs> there are some horrifyingly sad parts of it. Um, That's <laughs> terrible. Poor Dave. He's got his guitar. He's like, can I play this? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I, I this one's about going to church with my wife. <laughs> I seem to inspire this everywhere I go. So. Yeah, sorry about sorry about that. Anyhow, it's great talking to you because uh, otherwise my wife has to endure me. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, she's like, oh no! <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to. This, these are the conversations that I'm either having internally uh, all the time, anyways. Yeah. So yeah, it's fine. I always feel bad for Marty's wife, even at the parade when she was chasing. She oh. had the baby and the baby Bjorn, and she was on the sidelines chasing us in the car with a bottle of water. She for goes, Marty. Do you guys want water? <laughs> He's Salt running. of the earth. <laughs> See, that's what a good Christian does: <laughs> is chases after her man, asking <laughs> if he wants water, and me going, "I'm a grand marshal. Yeah. I don't talk to you, people. Screw off! I told you not to follow the car." <laughs> so, all right, we're up to May 2004 in there Dave's you go. <laughs> moving on in Dave's life. All right, let's uh, let's get some music on here. Uh, Dave is here to perform. He's uh, he's playing Bumbershoot, and uh, you're also doing a, a cool uh, pre Bumbershoot showcase with uh, the Satisfaction, the awesome. ladies that were knitting here on the podcast just a couple weeks ago. Ooh. Yeah, uh, a- ask him to whip you up a scarf. Um, what are you going to play for us first? Uh, this song is called Bearing Witness. It's off of Kersher Branches. All right. This is uh, Dave Bazan here on the podcast. I clung to miracles I have not seen. From ancient autographs I cannot read And though I've repented I'm still tempted I admit But it's not what bearing witness is Too full of fear and prophecy to see The revelation right in front of me So sick and tired of trying to make the pieces fit Because it's not what bearing witness is When the gap between what I hoped would be and what is makes me weep for my kids, I take a cleansing breath and make a positive confession. But is that what bearing witness is? Though it may alienate your family And blur the lines of your identity Let go of what you know and honor what exists Son, that's what bearing witness Daughter, that's what bearing witness is Oh, great stuff. Nice. David Bazan here on the podcast playing the uh, Bumbershoot Festival. Uh, on Sunday at the the Rockstar, Rockstar stage, and then uh, what? What do you have the details on the? Or maybe you have them. Maybe? I do. Oh. This is uh, the twenty eighth. So this upcoming Wednesday, the twenty eighth, at the Triple Door mm-hmm. with the Satisfaction and Lock Lamond. Yeah, and it's it's a it's also a Bumbershoot affiliated uh, event, and it's the Song Show, uh, which is like a regular thing, I guess. Um, that is put on at the triple door that's cool now that's you playing solo at the triple door at the triple door it'll be me solo and it's kind of a there's like singing and then somebody will be interviewing 
maybe me and the other bands and it's just talking about songwriting and uh as far as i as i mm-hmm. understand and then bumper shoots oh, the cool. band yeah, yeah. fun okay. we've had that comment time and time again that that getting to see what the i mean we're not the, we haven't interviewed uh, or we didn't invent the rock star interview but <laughs> um it is interesting to get you know a little bit behind the the surface of the the artist and find out what's going on yeah so yeah. it's cool to see that happening live as well um, and then uh, Bumbershoot, you said, is with the band? With the band, yeah. All right. And this is a band that you've only been playing. There was a, a big gap in your timeline there. For four years, you didn't tour and play at all. Um, I, I didn't tour with a band. I toured um, solo extensively, but uh, it wasn't until fall of 2009 that I started playing with a band again. And you're doing this uh, this house concert uh, business, uh-huh. yeah. which uh, we've had a couple artists in talking mm-hmm. about house concerts. Sounds like a, a cool way to make to make your way in the... The new era of yeah, it's of digital cool. music, I guess. Yeah, it's great because you know it. The the rock club infrastructure is not struggling the way that like the rest of the music business is, but it's nice to know that you can sort of function independently of any any of that and just go direct to fans in fans' houses, and it's really fun. Yeah, it seems like it's working out great for everyone. Yeah, well, we're gonna try that model for ourselves. In fact, we're in competition with you sadly on yeah. uh, wednesday we're doing our little uh backyard hoot nanny here there's a lot of people in this town <laughs> <laughs> i i'm hoping some of them yeah. go to your your <laughs> event because we're a little uh, concerned here about uh the size of our venue uh, which oddly enough i went to your website and you actually outline the the criteria for hosting a house concert very well much better than a lot of artists that are doing house concerts so i actually got the the premise pretty well like, what's from the criteria reading, well just having a big enough space that was yeah. like mentioned time and time again yeah that you know we just put out an email saying if we're going to be in these towns hey does anybody from these towns want to host a show on this date and then they just have to send a photo of their room or you know whatever and, yeah and then between my manager and booking agent and the host they evaluate how many people do you feel comfortable? That's a big part of it is that we don't want to, we're already treading on the, these people's goodwill by playing a show at their house for free, basically for them. And um, so we don't want to overwhelm them and like really pack it in. So. Uh, must have had a couple bad experiences, right? If you need to see a picture of the room. You know, we haven't. Uh, my manager, Bob, and my booking agent, Trey, have been so, like initially I said, I don't care where I play, I'll play in whatever uh, hole. Uh, yeah. That, and uh, they said, well, that's cool, but these people are paying 20 bucks and they're mostly grown ups, I'm guessing. So we're going to try to have it in good places for them. And so it's been working out good. That's awesome. Uh, David Bazan is here. And uh, so you can catch him Wednesday at the Triple Door or uh, the Sunday. What is that? September. I should know this. September 5th. Mm-hmm. Sunday, September 5th at Bumbershoot. One of um, the people in our chat room, real quick, went to one of your house concerts in Champaign. Mm-hmm. Apparently, it was incredible. Uh, it I'm was glad. incredible. Yeah. So that means there's nice. a lot of emphasis on all the syllables in that one. <laughs> uh, you you kind of are like suspect of that review. Was uh, that one in particular that I was scanning to to picture it? I that one was okay. Yeah, I felt okay about that right. one. What about uh, going back to your bio? There mm-hmm. was a an, a an appearance at South by Southwest. Oh yeah, <laughs> that you claim didn't go so well. Well, m- part- particularly my manager claims th- that it didn't go well. He, <laughs> in fact, you say in the second half of that bio installment is uh, he was thinking of a different way of making a living. Yeah, that's right. He wasn't. <laughs> I was. Uh, it was the very beginning of me playing solo, and um, I was having a hard time wrapping my mind around just about everything at that point except for a bottle of vodka <laughs> so, um so yeah it was just a little lackluster and uh but that was the moment where it was just like okay you got to do something here man you can't just limp along and, yeah uh, it's working what out. kind of a what kind of a drunk are you um i'm just you, a happy you're a happy drunk yeah, yeah yeah you're not belligerent you don't get belligerent no. start throwing chairs through plate glass windows no it's bad i'm at house just concerts really really happy kind of not like i love you man um necessarily but uh, just i love hanging out and it just enhances that love yeah yeah i always wonder though how how you can technically ply your craft when you're hammered not well yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no more wondering yeah now Some you know can, but we have your manager on line <laughs> one <laughs> he can't <laughs> all right david bazan we'll get another song from him in just a second here but first jody we'll, uh, 
uh, give us a little update on what's going on in the world. Oh my god, I have huge news today. You're not going to believe this. Mm -hmm. BP may let Tony Hayward go. Woo. Oh my god, I don't know why. I don't know why. They With a that. $20 million severance package. Well, of course, package. the man has to be paid. Yeah. Um, in more local news, and less duh... Murray Stenson. Does that name sound familiar to you? Murray Stenson, anybody? Mm -mm. Longtime bartender at the Zigzag Cafe in Seattle, and he's known for being the best bartender in town. Well, now it's more than that. He's the best bartender in all of America. Yeah. Yeah. Saturday night. Saturday night at the Tales of the Cocktail Festival. And this is not like some dumb drunk person's award. This is kind of a big deal. It's one of the highest honors in the industry. They were in New Orleans and top mixologists and drink historians from around the world were there. So if you're down in the Pike Place Market area, stop into the Zigzag and ask Murray to make you a drink. Although, wait a couple of days for him to get back from New Orleans. And maybe you should wait a couple months until that baby's out of you. I didn't say I was going to. Well. A group of 15 bicyclists in various stages of nakedness mm. rode from Belltown through Seattle and onto Capitol Hill over the weekend uh -huh. where they were stopped by Seattle right in front of Dick's Burgers and made to put on clothes. Apparently this ride was part of World Naked Bike Ride which is meant to dramatize the vulnerability of cyclists in car dominated cities. Ugh, I hate people like that. <laughs> so annoying. Uh, yeah, so they got naked to show how vulnerable they were. Uh -huh. They were dry. Not everyone was totally naked, though. I assume it was the ladies probably had underpants on. You don't want to sit on a bike seat without underwear, right? Am I right, you guys? Uh, no? That, that is true. That yeah. I don't want to sit on a bike seat. <laughs> I'm just saying a lot of terrible things could happen. I'm going to use it as a guy. I'm not sure you necessarily want to yeah, sit on a bike true. seat with no underwear. Maybe a, well, yeah. Yeah, but a guy with, uh, guys are allowed to take their shirts off in public. So, like, you kind of. Like, if you're just riding around in a Speedo on your bike, then you're not naked. Yeah. Like, for a man to really show his vulnerability, his stuff has to be out. Mm. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> David. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> hey, something really weird is going to happen this Thursday. I don't, know, uh, I don't know how I feel about it, but I think I feel bad. ABC's The View will be welcoming President Obama. Mm. Yeah. All right. Oh, Come on, President Obama talking to Elizabeth Hasselback? Why? Why yeah. should he have to do that? This is terrible. He shouldn't do it. New survey by Cisco finds that 50% of people use Facebook at work. Of that group, 7% say they play Farmville at work, which involves tending oh. and building your farm. Oh, gosh, that's but, a sad state of But here's, of here's, here's the kicker. Uh -huh. Guess how long they play Farmville for at work. Well, I guess if you're, if you're playing it, you're really into it. So 68 minutes. 68 minutes. Of your work day. And those people have jobs and we don't have jobs. Can you believe it? Man, oh man. But before that, I don't, you know, they always uh, focus on Facebook. But before that, people were, these same people were, you know, screwing off doing other things that right. weren't work related. Right. Now they just have a focal point on whether or not they're going to have grain for their creatures or something. I know. It does seem odd. Finally, let's talk about nerds fighting. This past weekend was Comic-Con. Uh, that's a convention where over 100,000 people descend upon San Diego, and it's the biggest nerd thing that goes on all year. On Saturday, a first happened at Comic-Con, a stabbing. Whoa. There were people waiting to see two movies, um, preview uh, premieres of two movies, and these two guys they got into an argument because one guy was sitting too close to the other guy and he was like, why don't you move? And he was like, why don't you move? And so they got into it and the one guy tried to stab the other guy with a pen in his eye. Oh, yeah. Went for his eye. Mm -hmm. That is rude. I mean, I'm scrappy, but you don't go straight for somebody's eye. You know, like somewhere, like, you know, knock him in the head, but like in the eye. Maybe God told him. Maybe God told him. It's true. Over the eye. Yeah. Well, he nope. missed. Fairly minor gash right next to his eye, but this is a first for Comic-Con, so maybe they... Uh, I don't know what they could cut back on. Pens? I, I'm shocked that the other guy didn't have a throwing star. I know. Personally. Or a sword. Defended himself. Some with. sort of laser. It is true. You would think that they would come armed with all sorts of comic book paraphernalia. You know, things they read about. Well, Gotta have one of those. I don't know if you'd try and stab no, Wolverine in the eye. You probably wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the news. Thanks for... I was Listening such a I was such a nerd growing up, and I was no. never in, I was I you know, I don't know surprising. Get out of here! And I was never into comic books. Never got into that no. uh, whole thing. Well, Comic Con isn't just comic books. I mean, Angelina Jolie was down there. <sighs> yeah, but that's how it all starts. What? I mean, that's the core. Comic books. Yeah. 
Well, there's comic books and then there's also the movies and the video games now. I'm not defending it. I'm not into that stuff either. But like it seems like a lot of stuff goes on at Comic-Con. You know, Shatner shows up. It's a big deal. Shatner's a big deal. Ever uh, ever into it, David? Or was that the antithesis of what you were into growing up? Um, I, I probably would have dug it a lot. I just never got into it. And when I uh, thought of getting into it, it seemed like I was too late. I missed the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, something else I, I got from your website that you actually, you've wanted to be a songwriter your whole life. Mm. Uh, and actually got a religion and philosophy degree in college because you thought that would make you a better songwriter, which which is amazing because it's the first legitimate reason I've ever heard from anyone for getting a philosophy degree. <laughs> <laughs> Most people, it's like it was a fallback. It's like, ah, my first uh, eight choices didn't work out. I just wanted to get out of college. I got a philosophy degree. Well, and to, to clarify, I didn't actually get the degree. I didn't, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't really jump through the, that hoop completely, uh, but that was the idea. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you went how far into uh, two years, and then uh, strangely, it, it was really strange, and it still seems so surreal. My dad sat me down and said, "You know, son, have you thought about taking time off from school yeah, yeah. to pursue the band?" And I was like, "Who is wow? This? That's totally backwards." <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I said, "No, I hadn't thought of that because I didn't think I was allowed to do that." Yeah, and uh, he's like, "Well, because my grades were starting to slip, and it was because I was so active with the band, and so I took a semester off." Uh huh. The, the dick fingers in the air. Right, right. Um, and uh, then I never went back. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, are you are you happy with that decision? Yeah, very. Yeah. Very happy. Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, yeah. What would have happened had you gone on and finished college? I just would have been in debt. Um, Were you? Was your dad paying for the school? Is that why he su suggested, son? Really? Uh, <laughs> if there's one thing I could suggest is my, me not paying for you anymore. No, a, a wealthy uh, relative uh, was footing the bill, but my grades were starting to suffer enough where they were talking about how I was going to have to maybe start pitching in or something unless I got my grades up. So. I see. A wealthy relative? That sounds good. Oh, we yeah. should all have one of those. We yeah. really should. They're very cool people. <laughs> I bet. In this one in particular, or just in general, a wealthy relative? Uh, <laughs> this one in particular, I I feel like they might mostly be. <laughs> Jerks. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> and no strings attached. I mean, it was like uh, they, they just they liked me. And you say wealthy relative because uh, if it was your grandparents, you would have said grandparents. So it almost sounds like a distant relative. Sounds like an aunt and uncle to me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was my my mom's first cousin. Oh. So my second cousin. That's impressive that they mm. would take you under their wing and, and consider your education important enough. I was blown away. Yeah. Was it? Oh, and, and and not I don't want to paint this uh, with the, the wrong way, but w were they trying to? Because you went to a a religious institution, right? I did. They're not religious. They don't care about that. They they so they didn't care where you went to school. This no. was just use. Oh, wow, yeah. that's that's amazing. Does that yeah. make you want to be nicer to your cousins? Uh, no, not necessarily. <laughs> uh, it makes me wonder why my cousins aren't so nice to me. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, again, that's that's the real Christian thing to do. Yeah, and they're not even. Yeah, to my knowledge. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and then did they, was there a, a payback at some point? Like, uh, did you have to join the family business? No, <laughs> no. It was Look, we have just this one guy. You, you just have to show your loyalty to the family. Uh, it wasn't anything like that. I did have to knock somebody off at one point, but I'm not allowed to at, go At Comic-Con? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah the saying. old pen to the eyeball. <laughs> All right. Uh, David Bazan is here. Uh uh, as the official podcast of Bumbershoot, we are very fortunate to have a Bumbershoot performer here in-house. Sunday, uh, September 5th at the Rockstar Stage, and then playing this Wednesday, the 28th of July at the Triple Door. Uh, what are you going to play next? Uh, this is the title track from Cursed Branches. All right. Title track here, David Bazan. The red and orange. Oh, red and yellow In which of these Do you believe If you're not sure right now Please take a moment but I need your signature before you leave When I sleep, I'm usually dreaming But 
but more and more There's only one Where every hired gun I've ever fired Is making love to you While I look on And all the fallen leaves Should curse their branches For not letting them decide Where they should fall And not letting them refuse to fall at all and Digging up the root of my confusion If no one planted it Then how does it grow? And why are some hell-bent upon There being an answer While some are quite content To answer, I don't know And all of all in leaves Should curse their branches For not letting them decide where they should fall And not letting them refuse to fall at all Oh, oh, oh All falling leaves should curse their branches. That's a little bit of that philosophy uh, <laughs> coming through there. Uh, David Bazan, uh, our Bumbershoot Showcase here, uh, coming to uh, Bumbershoot Sunday, September 5th. I highly encourage you uh, you take him in on uh, Sunday mm -hmm. or at the Triple Door on Wednesday if you're not coming to the Hootenanny. Right. If... Uh, do you have enough space at the triple door? Uh, that's uh, now I'm worrying about every performer. Is there enough space? I, uh, There's no I, swing set right in the middle of the triple door. I don't think they have the same concerns that we do. One of the activities I did this weekend was to go around. Uh, and it felt kind of dirty, dirty, like a sex I, predator. I went around the, the neighborhood and uh, handed the notices that we're going to have a party on on Wednesday. And uh, I've told our guests to be very polite and, right. and respect the parking situation here in the neighborhood. And but and my wife goes, "Why didn't you just talk to them?" And I'm like, "Cause I'm hiding. Yeah, I'm hiding. I feel so guilty." That's what you have to do in a wealthy neighborhood like this one. In my neighborhood, just be like, "Come on, <laughs> this is normal." No, don't you think even in anybody's neighborhood, this is kind of bending the the limits of good neighborliness we have decent people coming nobody's gonna make it's... a ruckus we don't have like crazy thrash metal going mm -hmm. i think people will just have their usual spot in front of their house like hey that's my spot but you know what it's not your spot yeah so just deal with it <laughs> people that's think probably, that the that's spot what the note is probably said right <laughs> yeah, not exactly. your spot, so just deal with i it. offered to write it <laughs> I offered to write I'm it. I'm shocked he didn't take you up on that. It is very interesting yeah. how people feel like the spot in front of their house where they always park is yeah. their spot and like they get really mad. I too. It's yeah. just like, whose car is that? You know? I don't park in front of my house. And so whenever the neighbors like use the spot in front of my house, they literally drop. I mean, it's nice of them. It's a nice gesture. They drop me a note and say, we apologize for leaving our car in front of your house. And I'm like, it makes our house look lived in. Right. Uh, As opposed to what usually goes on here. Uh-huh. Just dead. Dead. <laughs> <laughs> Why leave? We have everything here. It's a dead, empty house of a house <laughs> uh, except down here in the basement there's life oh yeah uh, David we were uh, absolutely correct in uh, in predicting that we would like you so thanks very much for, uh, <laughs> for spending you. some time with us it was really nice to meet you it was my pleasure uh, David me. Bazan uh, one of our uh, fun Bumbershoot performers uh, tomorrow again Chris Mays will join us uh, live from Austin with a review of the uh, the Robert Plant show 
And uh, and what else is going on? Our food critic Julian Perry will oh, be returning. Julian Perry. And then on Wednesday we have a band plus a disgruntled radio guy. So there'll be three of us. Yeah. <laughs> Three disgruntled radio guys. Um, Greg Herschel, who is the morning news anchor on Cairo for about 110 years, yep. will be joining us here. He's a fellow West Seattleite. Yeah. He'll be joining us here on the podcast on Wednesday. So that's what's coming up. And then, of course, Wednesday evening, it's the Hootenanny, which we will record and webcast live. Li- not live. Record. It'll be, it'll feel like it's live. Uh, yes, on a Friday morning. Okay. So that's what's coming up this week on the podcast. Thanks for starting the week with us. We'll uh, talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Holy independent since 2009, this has been the Marty Reamer Show Podcast. For more information about topics discussed, visit our website, martyreamer.com. That's Marty, R-I-E-M-E-R.com. Thank you for subscribing to the podcast. Tell your friends. They look nice. Oh, and to subscribe to our podcast, that too. The Marty Reamer Show is a production of Twisted Scholar Incorporated. Remember, in America, a corporation is a person too. I'm your rock star announcer, Blair Schultz. See you next time. Word out. Goodbye, Marty. Goodbye, Jody.